Hello, family. I'm Jill Morricone. We just welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel as we study the Gospel of Mark. It's hard to believe we're on lesson number seven, reaching just about to the middle of the Gospel of Mark, Teaching Disciples Part One. That's the title of this lesson. I want to introduce my family, your family on the set today. To my left, my pastor, John Lomagain. Good to be here, Jill. And my day is the cost of discipleship. It comes at a price. Mm, that sounds incredible. To Pastor John's left in the middle, my sis and mom is Jesus, <laughs> Dr. Yvonne Shelton. Thank you, Jill. My lesson is the mountain and the multitude. Amen. Mm. To Yvonne's left is Pastor John Denzi. I'm glad to be here. You know, the book of Mark is a wonderful book to study. And I have Wednesday, who is the greatest. Mm, that sounds like a great lesson. Last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled, The Healthy Man in Hell. Ooh, Ooh. great title this <laughs> week. I love that. It's going to be a power packed week. I want to remind you, you can get your copy of our notes if you would like to enhance your study of the Sabbath School lesson. All you have to do is email us ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. And we would love to email you our notes on a weekly basis. If you've already signed up, you don't have to email again. You are automatically going to get them every week. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, the opportunity is ours, but the work is yours. Mm. Thank you. Father, send your Holy Spirit to work in us both to yes. will and to do of your good pleasure. Yes. We pray that what we have written, what we have learned will be mm. disseminated under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Yes. And may the glory and honor that belongs to you go to you alone. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. 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 When we started the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, we talked about the two divisions in the book of Mark. Mark chapters one through eight is all about who is Jesus. As we study Jesus healing, Jesus teaching, we uncover new truths. Who is Jesus? This week in this lesson, Peter declares, you are the Christ. So the first eight chapters are who is Jesus? And we find that out this week. Jesus is Christ, the Messiah the Son of God. The second division of the book of Mark, chapters 9 through 16, is where is he going? So first of all, we find out who is Jesus. Then we look at where is he going, and Mark tells us he's going to the cross. The disciples didn't want to receive that. They didn't want to see that. This section that we're studying in this week and next, this week's lesson is called Teaching Disciples Part 1. Next week is Teaching Disciples Part 2. And it goes from Mark chapter 8, the middle of the chapter, all the way to Mark chapter 10. It's book ended by two healings of a blind man. Mm -hmm. So the first healing of the blind man we're going to study today. Then we have three predictions of the cross. Three mm -hmm. times Jesus tells the disciples, now you know who I am. I'm going to the cross. And they say, we don't want to receive it. Now you know who I am. I'm going to the cross. No, Lord, we don't want to receive that. Mm -hmm. And each time he gives a prediction, I'm going to the cross. He spends time in discipleship, spends time in teaching them. So that's what we're covering in a nutshell. This week and next week, the healing of the blind man, he's going to the cross, teachings on discipleship, that happens three times, and that it ends with the healing of another blind man, blind Bartimaeus. When you look at discipleship, we often think of the benefits, but there's also costs. And I think mm -hmm. Pastor John's gonna cover that. One of those costs we see in our memory text, let's read that. Mark 8, 34 is our memory text. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. This is some of the cost. Mm -hmm. Take up his cross and follow me. On Sunday, we look at seeing clearly, and we're going to look at the healing of the blind man, which opens this whole section, and then Peter declaring that Jesus is the Christ. So let's look there. We're in Mark 8. Turn with me to Mark 8, verse 22. We'll pick up the story here. This healing of the blind man only occurs in Mark. It doesn't occur in any of the other Gospels. And interestingly, it's the only healing in any of the Gospels that takes place in two stages. All the other healings happens once. Jesus speaks, Jesus touches, Jesus does something and the person's instantly healed. This is what we call a two-stage healing. So let's look at that. We're in Mark 8, 22. 
Then he came to Bethesda. This is at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So the blind man didn't come of his own. His friends, right, brought him to Jesus. And his friends said, Jesus, please touch this blind man. Heal him. Takeaway number one, you and I are called to stand in the gap for others. Okay. Mark chapter 2, we studied the story of the paralytic. He didn't come of his own. He couldn't even walk to Jesus. His friends carried him, and when the crowd was too tight, they opened up the roof and they let him down. We see here that these people, whoever they were, brought this blind man to Jesus. You and I are called to stand in the gap for others. You and I are called to bring other people before the throne of grace. Bring them to Jesus. I'm reminded of Ezekiel 22, verse 30. To me, this is a really sad scripture. I saw it for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. And I found no one. No one, the whole world, no one to stand in the gap. Takeaway number one, God calls you, stand in the gap for others. Let's keep reading. We're in Mark 8, verse 23. He, that's Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he'd spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Takeaway number two, Touch those in need. Did you notice Jesus took him by the hand? I love that. Mm -hmm. Led him out. He touched him. Now, in those days, in that culture, disease was considered a curse from God. It was considered that they had sinned. Remember in John 9, the man who was born blind, the disciples said, who sinned? This man or his mm -hmm. parents. You and I are called to reach out and touch the untouchable. We're called to touch those in need and offer redemption through Jesus. Keep reading, verse 24. And he looked up. So remember, Jesus has just spit on his eyes and he says, what do you see? And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Mm -hmm. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Takeaway number three, only Jesus enables us to see others clearly. Jesus' touch enabled him to see clearly. Do you ever wonder why we're judgmental toward other people? We need a touch from Jesus. You ever wonder why the spirit of criticism runs rampant? We need a touch from Jesus. Do you ever wonder why you can't forgive? You need a touch from Jesus. Okay. You ever wonder why you're jealous of other people? You need a touch from Jesus. Okay. You ever wonder why we compare ourselves amongst ourselves? We need a touch from Jesus. Right. Only Jesus enables us to see other people clearly. Now, before we go to Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, I want to touch just briefly on this two-stage healing. Jesus spit first, right? And then he said, what do you see? I see men like trees walking. And then he touched him and he was healed. Did Jesus not have power to do it instantly? Of course he did. He could heal in a moment. I'm reminded of when Jesus created Adam and Eve. Could he not have created Adam and Eve instantly at the same time? Of course he could. Of course. And yet he created Adam and then Adam recognized, oh, wow, I'm missing someone. And then he created Eve. We don't always understand what God is doing and the reasons for what he's doing. There's a couple of things I just want to bring out here. In that culture and time, they believed that spitting on someone's eyes, it was a remedy for them in the ancient world. So in one sense, you could say this is the combination of the medical knowledge of that time with supernatural healing. In other words, we think medicine works, and it does, but it's only Jesus who heals. It's only Jesus who brings life. Right. And an even deeper understanding, this is actually a spiritual metaphor, that Jesus is walking out. Remember we talked about this section as bookended by two blind men. So the initial section, they are beginning to understand who is Jesus. He is Christ, the Messiah. But is their understanding full? 
Do they clearly understand spiritual truths? No, they don't. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So God has an even fuller understanding and revelation that he wants to bring to his disciples and to you and I as well. So let's look at this turning point of the Gospel of Mark when we get to who is Jesus and Peter declares he is the Christ. So for that, we're gonna keep reading here. We're going down to verse 27, Mark 8, 27. Jesus and his disciples went out to the town of Caesarea Philippi. Now with the healing of the blind man, they were in Bethesda. Uh, but from Bethesda to Caesarea Philippi is about 20 to 25 miles. So they would have traveled north from the Sea of Galilee. This is into Gentile territory. There's idol worship. We're kind of leaving the Jewish territory more behind. And on the road, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? A good teacher asks good questions. Who do men say that I am? Now, is there multiple answers to this question or only one? There's truly only one answer. Jesus can't be multiple things. Takeaway number one, truth is absolute. Truth is not relative. Truth is not subjective. Truth is not, oh, this is my truth. This is your truth. There is only one correct answer in this situation. Who do men say that I am? It's not, oh, I believe Jesus is this. I believe he's that. No, there's only one correct answer because truth is absolute based on the authority of the word of God. Anytime someone comes to you and says, oh, that's your truth and I'm going to hold on to my truth. That is a lie from the enemy. Truth is absolute and it's found in the word of God. So how did the disciples answer in verse 28? They answered, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. Takeaway number two, truth divides people. Jesus asked the question and there were multiple answers. Everyone answered according to their own truth, but actually, None of them had it correct. Jesus wasn't Elijah. Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. He was Jesus, the Messiah. Keep reading. Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, meaning in Hebrew, the anointed one. You are the Christ. Take away three. With knowledge comes decision. If you know he's the Christ, what are you going to do with it? You see, it's not enough for you and I to read the Word of God. It's not enough for us to even acknowledge, oh, He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. You and I have to make a choice. And when you choose to follow Jesus, there are going to be some radical changes in your life and in mine. And I think Pastor John's going to talk about that. The cost of discipleship. The disciples would encounter this later as they moved throughout their ministry. This acknowledgement that Jesus was the Christ would cost them something. But was it worth it? It is always worth it to follow Jesus. So I just want to ask you in your life, who was Jesus to you? Is he John the Baptist or Elijah or is he your Christ and Savior? Amen. Thank Amen. you, Joe. Yeah. Wonderful foundation. Wow, wonderful. Beautiful segue. Mm -hmm. Thank you for setting it up in a beautiful way, divine way. Praise mm -hmm. God for that. Amen. Now that Jesus, uh, now that the Bible reveals that the disciples now know who Jesus is because it was just revealed, you are the Christ, they have to come to the conclusion as to what do we do now? You know, we are blessed with what they were not blessed with. We know from the very beginning of the reading of the book of Mark, in Mark chapter one, it clearly states who Jesus is. They didn't have the book of Mark in their day, so they had to find out and Jesus in questioning them made it very clear. If you're gonna follow me, you need to know who I am. When you know who I am, then following me becomes more relevant, more pertinent, more necessary, because you're not following just anyone, not a good teacher, but you're following the Christ. And there's a difference. Who you follow makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Are you following a church leader? Are you following just your denomination? Are you following just a set of doctrines? If you're following something, then you're not yet where they were. They have to follow someone. Mm -hmm. And they, know, and they now know that the one they're following is the Christ. So verses 31 to 38, now that you know who you're following, you need to know the cost of following me. Let's follow this together, read this together, or follow me as I read these verses. And then, Jill, I have uh, six takeaways, and then I'm going to make a turn on one of those because it's very relevant as to why we follow Christ. Verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke his word, he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In other words, don't make it too obvious. That's what he was in essence saying, because he know that now that Jesus declares himself openly, more conflict is going to arise. But verse 33, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, now he's laying down the cost. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And by the way, Matthew says, take up that cross daily. For whoever decides, desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So he lays down the stipulations. And from this point on, now we're going to break down the six takeaways as to why it's very important. There are re requisites, now not prerequisites, but requisites to following the Lord, a fundamental, a conditional, a stipulative walk with Christ. There has to be some conditions as to why you're following Christ. Mm -hmm. Don't join the church because you like the music. Why have you joined the church? Mm -hmm. Don't join it because of great community programs. If you have joined it for any other reason than following God's word and following Jesus, then you have not become a disciple. You're just a church member. Mm. So a disciple, the first one is relinquishing of personal methods and preferences. Mm. That's very clear when Jesus spoke to John and Peter after his resurrection. Look at John 21 verse 18. He made it very clear to Peter now converted what the stipulation is. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, John 21, 18, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. One of the signs of discipleship is, are you going where you want to go? Or are you the one saying, well, the Lord has to tell me himself. Okay. His word is not sufficient. Some people walk into this wall called self-sufficiency when they say, well, I know what God's word says, but until the Holy Spirit reveals it to me directly, or until God tells me, and I've said to people before, are you waiting for an email from God? <laughs> this is God's knee mail. Get on your knees and ask the Lord That's to good. change your heart. Yeah. The second thing of a disciple is dedication to God's law. So many people say they're dedicated to God, but they're not dedicated to his law. Mm -hmm. You can't be one or the other. Look at Isaiah 8, 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. One of the only places in the Old Testament where the word disciple exists. In 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Right. Unlike maybe some clergy say you're still under that burdensome law. According to God's word, it's not a burden. It's an example of love. Thirdly, we are emulators of Jesus, an example, teaching, and life. Luke 6, 46, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he, Jesus, walked. Let Jesus be your example in all things, not just in some things. You know, people follow Jesus until he does something that they don't really adhere to doctrinally. And then they say, well, my pastor says, follow Jesus in all examples. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing, a discernment as to the source of your religious teachings. Where do your beliefs come from? Is it a denominational thing, which is not a bad thing as long as it's from the Bible. If your denomination has its foundation in God's word, mm -hmm. then you're safe. But if it's just because your denomination says this, then you're on dangerous ground. John 7:17. 7, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. On whose authority do you believe what you believe? The fifth thing, disciples must have a daily commitment to the journey of Christianity. Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily yeah. and follow me. Not just on weekends, not just when you go into church, yeah. but daily. And that's something that so many people are still trying to figure out how to do. And the sixth point, daily choose to keep the flesh under the Holy Spirit's control. Now, this is where I'm going to make a little turn here. 
Galatians 5.16, so many people misunderstand what I'm about to read, and I'm going to break it down. Galatians 5.16 to 18, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things which you wish, or that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, here's the wall that so many people miss. They think that that phrase by Paul means you're not under the commandments of God. Wrong. When you read Galatians, clearly verses 16 to 18, it says, if you are in the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, what law? Let's go to Romans very quickly. Romans 7, verse 23. Paul understood that there was another law operating in him while God's law was in his mind. Notice what he said. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Mm -hmm. So what Paul is saying in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 18, is when you walk in the spirit, you are not under the law that Paul says, which is the law of sin in your members. You are not under that. Right. When you're under that, look what happens. Now he goes to verses 19 in Galatians 5 and says, what happens when you are under the law? Not under the commandments, not under the ceremonial law, but under the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. Here it is, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice, that's what happens when you are under the law of sin and death. But notice the contrast. Look at Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and look at the tag. Yes. Against such there is no law. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. What is Paul saying? He mentions not under the law in verses at the end of verse 18, you are not under the law, meaning if you are under it, all manner of evil will be perpetrated in your body because that law leads you to all the things he describes in verse 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. But when you are under the spirit, he said, there is no law that prevents you from being too kind, too loving, mm -hmm. too joyful, too long suffering, too good, too faithful, too gentle. There is no law that prevents that. So when you read that, don't think that he's talking about the law of God. He talks about the law of sin and death. And why is he saying that? Romans 8, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Not subject to it. So if you're not under God's law, what law are you under? The law of sin and death. In Romans 8, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, mm -hmm. but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So you see clearly there's a contrast. Either you're walking in the Spirit or you're walking in the flesh. Now, walking in the Spirit is not against the commandments of God because Paul says the law is holy and the commandments holy, just, and good. Romans 7, verse 12. So whenever you read, not under the law, do not think that means under the commandments of God. We are all in obligation. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. But when you are walking in the spirit, the law of sin and death are not in operation in your life. That is really the true cost of discipleship. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Amen. We're just getting started. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3 ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to our study on Teaching Disciples, Part 1. We're going to pass it over to my sis, Dr. Yvonne. Thank you, Jill. This has been so rich. Thank you both so much. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Mountain and the Multitude, and it's based on Mark 9. And let's uh, start by reading Mark 9, verses 1 through 8. And there are parallel um, s scriptures that go along with this. Matthew 16, verses 20 
8 through chapter 17, verse 13, and Luke 9, verses 27 through 36. So let's start with reading uh, Mark 9, verses 1 through 8. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Mm. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Mm. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Mm. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. In verse 1, Christ alluded to an upcoming demonstration of the power of God, and six days later, it happened in the transfiguration of Jesus. And there were three stages of this transfiguration. In the first stage, as we find in Luke 9, 29, there was a change in Christ's appearance. It says that the, his face, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And I like in Mark how it said no launderer could make it that white, like Clorox couldn't do it. <laughs> Nothing could do that. It was glistening and white. This was a revelation, <clears throat> excuse me, of Christ, uh, his veiled glory. And here's how Ellen White describes it in The Desire of Ages, page 241. She says, his prayer is heard while he is bowed in lowliness upon the stony ground. Suddenly the heavens open and golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide and holy radiance descends upon the mount enshrouding the Savior's form. Divinity from within flashes through humanity, I love that, and meets the glory coming from above. Arising from his prostrate position, Christ stands in godlike majesty. The soul agony is gone. His countenance now shines as the sun and his garments are white as snow. The transformation happened as he prayed. It says, as he prayed. And so prayer and drawing closer to God can also change our appearance. Both my sons, Mark and Jason, had one kind of countenance before they came to the Lord. Yeah. And as I look at their pictures from before Christ, BC, I see such a difference in their eyes. And now their eyes show something different. They show the love of Jesus in their countenances. So I'm so thankful to the Lord and I praise Jesus for that. Mm -hmm. The second stage of the transfiguration was the conversation with Moses and Elijah that we find in verse four, the disciples and Jesus had trudged up a mountain. <laughs> they, they had gone up to the mountaintop, so they were tired. And in their weariness, they fell asleep, but they were awakened to see the radiant form of their master talking to two heavenly beings, Moses and Elijah. They were there to encourage Christ on his mission and the conversation was about the crucifixion. The conversation was to let Jesus know that he had all of heaven's support, all of heaven's sympathy in what he was doing. Jesus was reassured that he was the hope of the world, the salvation of every human being who believes in him. And it's interesting to me that the Father didn't send angels. He sent men, mm -hmm. yeah. men who could identify with Jesus in his, in suffering, in trials, in the challenges of leading others to him, to, to God, to himself. And so it is interesting to me that they had suffered rejection and trials as well. So they could relate to Jesus in a way that angels could not. And then the third stage was the voice from heaven. In verse five, Peter, as he was known to do, blurted out, you know, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Remember at the baptism of Christ, we heard 
this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased in Matthew 3:17. So it is here. We hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. He wants us to listen to the voice of Jesus. We are to hear Jesus' voice when we are going through trials. We are to listen to the voice of Christ. We are to be open to his voice. Whenever he says to us, cast your cares upon me because I care about you, we're to hear him when he tells us of God's mercy and forgiveness. We're to hear Christ when he warns us through his Holy Spirit that we're heading down the wrong road. We're to hear him whenever he speaks to us, but we must learn to listen. We have to put away all distractions, take out the word and trust him as we listen to his voice. Then, so we have the three stages of the transfiguration, right? We have the alteration of Christ's appearance. We have the conversation with Moses and Elijah. And then we have hearing the voice of God. And then we move on in Mark 9 to after Christ came down from that mountaintop, what happened? You know, sometimes we have mountaintop experiences and then we have valley experiences. <laughs> Jesus had just left a glorified experience on the mountaintop, but when he came down and returned to the foot of the mountain, there was chaos. There was distress because his disciples that had been left down there, remember Pete, Christ took Peter, James, and John with him to the top of the mountain, but when they came down, the other nine disciples were down there and they had just had a situation that left them with disappointment and humiliation. The scribes were there, the people were there, and they were unable to do something. Let's see what they were unable to do. It says that there was a boy that was tormented by an evil spirit, and it had caused him to be mute for years. The spirit had thrown the boy into fire and water, trying to kill him and had been unable to do so, but the boy could not be healed. And the father had brought the boy to the disciples and the disciples couldn't do it. And they were so embarrassed by the fact that they were unable to do it. The boy's father approached Jesus and said, teacher, in verse 17, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered him saying, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus asked the father a few questions while the evil spirit had thrown the boy down. The boy is gnashing at his teeth, foaming at the mouth mm. and wallowing in the dirt. And the father frustrated says, but if you can do anything to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And I love how Jesus turned it around. And he said in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe mm -hmm. all things are possible, to him who believes. And the father mustering up all the faith that he had, he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus cast out the demon and presented the boy to his father, whole and well. There are three takeaways here. The first one is, why couldn't the disciples cast out the demons? Why is it that we don't obtain victory over the evil spirits that tempt us? Sometimes our hearts are not right. Ellen White said that, in, uh, uh, in the Desire of Ages that the nine were jealous of the three. And so they had jealousy in their hearts. So that the spirit, the evil spirit couldn't be cast out because they did not have a right spirit in trying to do that. We need to also come to God asking for forgiveness and cleansing. And then number two, to succeed in a spiritual conflict, our faith must be strengthened through fervent prayer and fasting. In verse 29, Jesus said, some things goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And then number three, in order to have victory, we need a faith that leads to an unreserved consecration to the work of Christ, and then nothing shall be impossible to us. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, we continue in 
uh, Mark chapter 9, and my name is John Dinsey. We have Wednesday, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? In the top of the lesson, it says to read Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through 41. And it says, what is different about Jesus' second prediction of his death and resurrection? And to compare this with Mark 8.31. Also, what do the disciples argue about? <laughs> and what instructions does Jesus give? So reading again, Mark 8.31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So comparing this with Mark chapter 9, verse 30, 31 and 32, then they departed from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. So uh, I'm reading to you from the lesson itself. And it, it's uh, very well done. It says in the first prediction, Jesus refers to those who will reject him and kill him. In the second prediction, Jesus refers to the fact that he will be betrayed. The betrayer is not pointed out at this time, but it says the reader already knows who it is because of the identification of Judas in Mark chapter 3, verse 19. And so it is when Jesus now talks to his disciples and tells them that he's going to be betrayed. Uh, you know, this is the second time he's repeating this. And, but this time he adds that he will be betrayed. It's interesting, they didn't ask, well, who's going to betray him? Who's going to do this thing at this point? We know that later they wanted to know because he said, somebody here at the table is going to betray me. And they were all wondering who it was. Is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? And this is something that we need to keep in mind. So, uh, so now when we talk about Jesus and being betrayed, to them it was something just, what? This, this cannot be. You, uh, you already noticed that as we were discussing this lesson, Jesus openly uh, said to them, who do men say that I am? And then eventually he says, don't tell anybody that I am the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So they knew that he was the Messiah. And, but Jesus is talking about being betrayed and being killed, being rejected. And to them, that didn't, didn't compute. They didn't uh, capture this. They didn't understand this because, you know, the Messiah is not supposed to be killed. I mean, you, when you start reasoning the way, the things they were taught, the Messiah is not supposed to be killed. He's supposed to go to the throne. He's supposed to deliver us from all our enemies. Uh, we're supposed to be uh, the head and not the tail in the world. And when you talk about what they had seen, Jesus had walked on water in Mark chapter 6, verses 47 and 48. Jesus had fed 4,000. Jesus had fed 5,000 people. Uh, have they seen that before? No. Wait a minute. Jesus was healing blind people, raising the dead. This, 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 he's going to the throne. He is going to the throne. And so uh, the blind were seeing, the lame were walking. Jesus is going to the throne. He's not going to be killed. To them, it was just something that did not compute. And so uh, in uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30, you heard about Peter confessing that you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Uh, so they knew, they knew that he was the Christ. And it, it really boggles the mind for us as we look at, look back and say, well, what, what, why didn't they get this? Why didn't they get this? Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to see that they were so blinded by what they had been taught that they mm -hmm. failed to see mm -hmm. that his life was a life of suffering mm -hmm. and that he was going to uh, be crucified and died. And he told them, this is going to happen to him. Now, in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 30, as we said, uh, Peter confesses that he's the Christ. But what happens to Peter after Jesus says that, that uh, uh, Peter says, wait a minute, this is not going to happen to you. No, no, he re Peter rebuked Jesus. Mm. And so uh, Jesus had to rebuke Peter <laughs> because it says here, uh, in verse 33, Mark 8, 33. But when he had turned about and looked at his disciples, we already, we already read this. He rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest 
not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So when we get to Mark chapter 9, verse 33, and you find that uh, they were talking about who is going to be the greatest, something marvelous had already happened. The transfiguration mm -hmm. that Dr. Ivan had already mentioned. So this was in their mind. This was in their mind. Now they're talking about who's going to be the greatest in this kingdom. Mm -hmm. We just saw him transfigured. This is the Messiah. Mark chapter 9. Let's go. Verse 33 and 34. Then he came to Capernaum, Cap Capernaum and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Mm -hmm. But they kept silent. <laughs> For on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And <laughs> it's a good time to keep quiet <laughs> because uh, they understood that this was not a conversation that Jesus would be happy about. Mm -hmm. Now, why would they also keep quiet? Because they also, like Peter, believed that Jesus was going to go to the throne. And now they're wondering, where, what am I going to, where am I going to be? What am I going to be handled? Judas was probably saying, I'm going to have the whole treasury. This is going to be a great <laughs> thing for me. And so they were disputing who would be the greatest, who would be the greatest. And they did not want to be rebuked like Peter was, a good time to keep quiet. Mm. So... Um, we move to verse 35, my, Mark chapter 9, verse 35. And he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Wow, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. I, I want to be first, but wait, I'm going to be servant of all? I, that doesn't sound too good for me. <laughs> Uh, then he took a little child and set them in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Mm -hmm. Wow, powerful. When you consider the thought in those days, women were considered low and children were considered low in society. And Jesus is saying to them, you have to become as a little child. And, you know, you think about it. Jesus is trying to tell them, you have to be humble. You have to be humble. And Jesus himself was humble. Mm -hmm. And he says, I am meek and lowly of heart. They could not argue with what Jesus was saying. In the book, Desire of Ages, page 409, notice what it says here. Even the disciples, though outwardly they had left off for Jesus' sake, had not in heart ceased to seek great things yeah. for themselves. Mm -hmm. It was this spirit that prompted the strife as to who should be greatest. So still there was this element in them as going high, going high, being the greatest. And notice what it says here. It was this that came between them and Christ. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Making them so little in sympathy with his mission of self-sacrifice. So slow to comprehend the mystery of redemption. As leaven, it left to comprehend. If left to complete its work will cause corruption and decay, so does self-seeking spirit, cherished work the defilement and ruin of the soul. Mm -hmm. Question, does that happen today? Do we see that? Mm -hmm. Do we see that in God's uh, body of believers? Do we see that in God's family? Uh, you see that in churches. Uh, there are people that have been in certain positions for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and they don't want to give that up. They think they have a right to it and they'll fight tooth and nail to keep there. Uh, and uh, this has happened in churches. So Jesus has a lesson for us. Whoever wants to be greatest, let him be servant of all. So this is a lesson for us as well. What must we do? We must become as little children. And so we have to ask ourselves, when you look at Jesus, we have to remember that he said, um, Come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And if we are to imitate Jesus, we have to be a servant. He was a servant. I mean, it just, for me, when I think of Jesus uh, at that last supper scene, grabbing a towel, grabbing the water, washing the disciples' feet, mm -hmm. what a sign, what a message 
it is for us to understand that if Jesus humbled himself and washed the disciples' feet, yes, there's a deep meaning in that as well. Mm -hmm. But remember that Jesus left an example that we should serve one another. Amen. 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 Yeah, that's really powerful. Rebuking the rebuker. <laughs> Rebuking the rebuke. That's a good sermon title. Mm -hmm. And I really love the, what you had to share there, Yvonne, about how we need to learn to listen to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise God. And we need to follow someone, not just something. Mm -hmm. And then that partial understanding revealed by the partial healing, that's a really great insight. Mm -hmm. That is really powerful to think about how Jesus was trying to reveal to the disciples that they weren't fully understanding who he was. This whole lesson has been powerful. I'm actually going to deviate a little bit because when we get to the end of the lesson here, I'm in Mark chapter 9, 42 to 50. We start talking now about hell and hell fire. Uh, my name is James Rafferty and I have Thursday's lesson and it's entitled The Healthy Man in Hell. <laughs> and I guess, you know, there's a little deviation here. I like how everything was tied together, but verses 42 through 50 is where we're going to pick up here is talking a little bit about uh, the consequences of rejecting and not recognizing Christ, not listening to Christ, uh, not seeing him as the one we are to follow and not fully understanding who he is. Verse 42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands go into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter light, a halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. There's that emphasis again. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Four times that's emphasized. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith shall it ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. And this final phrase here, the salt, is a transition from the fire. Salt and fire here are kind of used interchangeably, but just look at that one phrase there. It talks about how we're to be salted with fire. There's something about fire here that ties all of these verses together. So these passages at first, the quarterly goes on to say, seem to be collections of disparate teachings uh, that are thrown together without any rhyme or reason. However, a closer look reveals that each successive teaching has a catchword connection to the previous one. The passages revolve around three main terms that move the instruction forward step by step. This cause to sin, the fire, and the salt. The first teaching is about little ones, referring to believers and teachers and leaders are asked to, to lead people into the kingdom of God with the responsibility to care for those new converts with special care. Mm -hmm. Similarly to the Old Testament ethic of caring for those weakest in the ancient society, like widows and all orphans and foreigners. Jesus speaks in exaggerated language, hyperbole we call it, that it would be better to be drowned in the sea than to cause one of these little ones to sin. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, drowned in the sea with a millstone hung around your neck. That is mm -hmm. with a sense of no survival. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna float. You're not gonna be able to swim if you have a millstone uh, around your neck if you're cast into the sea. So mm -hmm. this catchphrase, causes to sin, leads to the longest teaching in this pair passage. And again, I'm still reading from the quarterly. Two conundrums confront the reader. First, is Jesus really teaching that people are to cut off a hand or a foot or <laughs> pluck out an eye? And second, is he teaching an eternally burning hell? Now, the answer to the first question is no, Jesus is not teaching mutilation. That was rejected in Judaism, according to Deuteronomy 14.1 and 1 Kings 18.27 and 28. The Lord is using hyperbole again to make his point. If losing a hand or a foot or an eye is terrible, how much more of a disaster would it be for the Christian to, to sin? The second question also receives a negative no. Jesus is not teaching an eternally burning hell. How do we know? Well, hell's consequences are eternal. Suffering in hell 
is not. Mm -hmm. And we need to really clarify this. So we're going to look at a few verses, Revelation 14, 10, Revelation 15, 2. I'm just going to give you all the verses right up front. Isaiah 33, 14 to 16, Hebrews 12, 29, Malachi 4, verse 3, and Ezekiel 28, verse 18. The fire is everlasting, but the material being burned is not. The Bible does not teach that the lost are immortal. Only the saved are granted immortality, and that's going to be at the second coming of Jesus. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Those who believe in Jesus have eternal life. Those who don't believe perish. Those who are lost do not burn forever. Instead, they perish forever. And there's a very big difference. Notice Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The consuming of the wicked takes place in the presence of God, in the presence of of the holy angels. So God himself is a consuming fire. That's Revelation, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. It says, our God is a consuming fire. Let's look again in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over the image of the beast, over his mark, over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. God's people can stand on the sea of glass mingled with fire. The wicked are consumed by that same fire. The fire of God consumes the wicked. The fire of God protects those who are righteous, those who are saved. Isaiah 33 really brings this point to clarification. Verse 14 of Isaiah 33 says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He that despises the gains of oppressions and that shakes his hands from holding of bribes, that stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell in high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. So Isaiah 33 brings out this clear picture of those who can stand in the everlasting burnings. When the holy city Jerusalem comes down to this earth, after the millennium, the thousand years, Revelation chapter 20 shows us that the wicked are resurrected. They surround the city of God. Inside the city of God, God's people are standing in His presence, in the presence of this holy fire, this, this eternal fire in the presence of God Himself. The wicked will not be able to stand in that presence. That presence, God's presence, the fire of God will consume the wicked and it will burn up this entire world. There's going to be a literal fire that consumes all all of the wicked and all wickedness. Malachi again tells us, verse 3 of chapter 4, that the wicked will be consumed to ash. It tells us in Ezekiel 28 and verse 18 that Satan himself will be brought to ashes upon the earth. So, of course, that fire is not going to burn for all eternity, not in relationship to the wicked. The fire of God is everlasting in His presence, but the fire of the wicked in hell is not everlasting because that fire will do its job. It will consume the wicked, and the wicked will become ash upon this earth. And then God will make a new heavens and a new earth. The fire of God, this everlasting fire, is going to be something that we can dwell in in, uh, in the presence of, just like Moses was able to dwell in the presence of God and his countenance revealed the fire of God's love. And when he came down off the mountain, you remember he looked on the people and the people couldn't, couldn't even bear to look at his face that was reflecting this, this, this fire of God, this, this radiance of God, this light of God. And so he put a veil over his face. And so we see here in the same context that the Bible is teaching about those who can dwell in the presence of God, in the presence of the eternal fire of God, and those who are going to be consumed by that eternal fire. And we see then that this eternal fire that is in God's presence is going to have a different nature, a different reaction upon those who are filled with sin. 
our prayer is that the fire of the Holy Spirit may fall upon us as believers, just like it fell upon the believers at Pentecost and light us up with the fire of God's everlasting presence that we can reflect His goodness, His light, His glory to those around us today. As you said, Yvonne, with your, with your two sons, their countenance changed. Mm -hmm. When they accepted Jesus Christ, they reflected a difference in their countenance. They, the love of God was reflected through them. Their, the brightness of His presence was reflected through them. May that be our experience also. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James, Amen. Pastor Johnny, Yvonne, and Pastor John. What an incredible study. Such richness in the Word of God. Amen. I want to give each one of you a moment to share about your day. Pastor John. Well, the cost of discipleship is not going to be lessened. It's not going to be a discount. It's not going to be moved out of the way. If you really want to follow the Lord, the, the active word is, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Now, the denial doesn't mean you lose anything. It means you gain everything. Mm. Amen. Amen. If John 15 says, if we abide in Christ, all things are possible. Without him, nothing is possible. We can't do anything on any level that has spiritual impact without Christ. Mm -hmm. So we are invited to abide in him and with him, all things are possible. Our faith can be improved, all of that with Christ. All things are possible. Amen. 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 Well, if you have noticed in yourself a desire to be the greatest, from Desire of Ages, I bring you this message. Zeal for God's glory is the motive implanted by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And only the effectual working of the Spirit can implant this motive. Only the power of God can banish self-seeking and hypocrisy. Give all to Jesus and you will be in the right way. Amen. amen, amen. You know, John the Baptist, speaking of Christ, says, someone is coming after me that's going to baptize you with water and with fire. Amen. And Jesus longs for us to be baptized with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire. Open your hearts, receive that spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What an incredible study. We want to invite you to join us next week. Lesson number eight for Teaching Disciples Part Two. We're going to have more teaching on discipleship. One more prediction where Jesus says, the cross is coming and I will be crucified and rise the third day. And then the following book end where blind Bartimaeus is healed and he receives sight. I want to encourage you. I'm reminded of Revelation chapter three, verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm. If anyone hears my voice, I encourage you to open up your heart. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart right now. Open up and let him in.